a little apprehensive when I uh, use a music stand ministering. <laughs> Mainly because I was in a church up in, I think, Oregon or somewhere. And I put my Bible on top of the music stand. And while I was speaking, the Bible was kind of heavy. The music stand started going down, <laughs> giving the impression that I was growing while I was speaking. <laughs> so I was just thankful that I wasn't preaching on, I must decrease and he must increase. Okay, I trust you opened your Bibles at Romans 3, verse 19. Before we read Scripture, let me share a few statistics with you. In the late 70s, God very graciously opened an itinerant ministry for me, and as I began to travel, I had access to church growth records, and I found to my horror that something like 80, even 90 percent of those making a decision for Christ were falling away from their faith. Let me make it more real for you. In 1991, a major denomination in the U.S. was able to obtain 294,000 decisions for Christ. That is, in one year, it obtained 294,000 decisions for Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, they could only find 14,000 in fellowship, which means they couldn't account for 280,000 of their decisions. And this is normal, modern evangelical results, and something I discovered way back in the late 70s, and something which greatly disturbed me. I began to make it a matter of prayer, study the book of Romans, and particularly the gospel proclamation of men like Finney, Spurgeon, Whitfield, Wesley, Moody, and others that God used down through the ages. And I found they used a principle which is almost entirely neglected by modern evangelical methods. I began teaching that principle. Eventually, we were invited to base our ministry in the U.S., particularly to bring this teaching to the Church of America. We were here for three years, and things were kind of slow. Me and David Wilkerson called from New York. It heard the teaching on audio in his car, called me from his car phone, and immediately flew me 3,000 miles from L.A. to New York to share the one-hour teaching with his church. He considered it to be that important. I heard recently of a pastor who listened to the audio tape, the one-hour audio tape, 250 times. I'd be happy if you'd listen just once to this teaching, which is called Hell's Best Kept Secret. The Bible says in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What is it that Scripture says is perfect and actually converts the soul? Why, it makes it very clear the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, to illustrate the function of God's law, let's look for a few moments at civil law. Imagine if I said to you, I have got some good news for you today. This is great news. Someone has just paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. You'd probably react by saying, what are you talking about? I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. My good news wouldn't be good news to you. It would be foolishness. It wouldn't make sense. But more than that, it would be offensive to you because I'm insinuating you've broken the law when you don't think you have. But if I put it this way, it may make more sense. On your way to the meeting today, the law clocked you at going 55 miles an hour through an area set aside for a blind children's convention. There were 10 clear warning signs stating that 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed, but you went straight through at 55 miles an hour. What you did was extremely dangerous. There's a $25,000 fine. The law was about to take its course when someone you don't even know stepped in and paid the fine for you. You are very fortunate. Can you see that telling you precisely what you've done wrong first actually makes the good news make sense? If I don't bring instruction and understanding you've violated the law, then the good news will seem foolishness, it will seem offensive, but once you understand that you've violated that law, then the good news will become good news indeed. Now, in the same way, if I approach an impenitent sinner, someone whose understanding is darkened and say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, it'll be foolishness to him and offensive to him. Foolishness because it won't make sense. The Bible says that. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And offensive because I'm insinuating he's a sinner when he doesn't think he is. As far as he's concerned, there are plenty of people far worse than him. But if I take the time to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and open up the divine law, the Ten Commandments, and show the sinner precisely what he's done wrong, that he has offended God by violating his law, then when he becomes, as James says, convinced of the law as a transgressor, the good news of the fine being paid for will not be foolishness, it will not be offensive, it will be the power of God unto salvation. Now, with those few thoughts in mind by way of introduction, let's now look at Romans 3, verse 19, and we'll look at some of the functions of the law of God for humanity. Romans 3, verse 19 says, Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. 
So one function of God's law is to stop sinners' mouths, to stop them justifying themselves and saying, there's plenty of people worse than me. I'm not a bad person. No, the law stops the mouth of justification and leaves the whole world, not just Jews, but the whole world guilty before God. Following verse, Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. God's law tells us what sin is. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4 says sin is transgression of the law. Romans 7, verse 7. Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. And then he says an amazing statement. He said, no, I had not known sin, but by the law. The apostle Paul says, I didn't know what sin was until the law told me. In Galatians 3, 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So another function of God's law is to act as a schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ that we might be justified through faith in his blood. The law doesn't help us, it just leaves us helpless. It doesn't justify us, it just leaves us guilty before the judgment bar of a holy God. And the tragedy of modern evangelism is because around the turn of the century, when for some reason it forsook the law in its capacity to convert the soul, to drive sinners to Christ, Modern evangelism, therefore, had to find another reason for sinners to respond to the gospel. And the issue that modern evangelism chose was the issue of life enhancement. The gospel degenerated into Jesus Christ will give you peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. Now, to illustrate the unscriptural nature of this very popular teaching, I'd like you to listen very carefully to this following anecdote, because the essence of what I'm saying pivots on this particular point. So please listen very carefully. Two men are seated on a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on as it would improve his flight. He's a little skeptical at first as he can't see how wearing a parachute in a plane could possibly improve the flight. After a time, he decides to experiment and see if the claim is true. As he puts it on, he notices the weight of it upon his shoulders and he finds he has difficulty in sitting upright. However, he consoles himself with the fact that he was told the parachute would improve the flight, so he decides to give the thing a little time. As he waits, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him because he's wearing a parachute in a plane. He begins to feel somewhat humiliated. As they begin, begin to point and laugh at him, he can stand it no longer. He slinks in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it to the floor. Disillusionment and bitterness fill his heart because as far as he was concerned, he was told an outright lie. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts the parachute on. He doesn't notice the weight upon his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without that parachute. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of each passenger's experience. The first man's motive for putting the parachute on was solely to improve his flight. The result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the passengers, he was disillusioned, and somewhat embittered against those who gave him the parachute. As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before anyone gets one of those things on his back again. The second man put the parachute on solely to escape the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him without it, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart, knowing that he's saved from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers. His attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Now listen to what the modern gospel says. It says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. So the sinner responds, and in an experimental fashion, puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? The promise, temptation, tribulation, and persecution. So what does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offended for the word's sake. He's disillusioned and somewhat embittered, and quite rightly so. He was promised peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness, and all he got were trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed at those who gave him the so-called good news. His latter end becomes worse than the first, another inoculated and bitter backslider. Saints, instead of preaching that Jesus improves the flight, we should be warning the passengers that they're going to have to jump out of the plane, that it's appointed a man once to die, and after this the judgment. And when a sinner understands the horrific consequences of breaking God's law, then he will flee to the Savior solely to escape the wrath that's to come. And if we're true and faithful witnesses, that's what we'll be preaching, that there is wrath to come, that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. You see, the issue isn't one of happiness, but one of righteousness. It doesn't matter how happy a sinner is. 
how much he's enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. Without the righteousness of Christ, he'll perish in the day of wrath. Scriptures warn, riches profit not on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Peace and joy are legitimate fruits of salvation, but it's not legitimate to use these fruits as a draw card for salvation. If we continue to do so, sinners will respond with an impure motive, lacking repentance. Now, can you remember why the second passenger had joy and peace in his heart? It was because he knew that parachute was going to save him from sure death. And as a believer, I have joy and peace in believing because I know that the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver me from the wrath that's to come. Now, with that thought in mind, let's take a close look at an incident on board the plane. We have a brand new stewardess. She's carrying a tray of boiling hot coffee. It's her first day. She wants to leave an impression on the passengers, and she certainly does. Because she's just walking down the aisle, she trips over someone's foot and slops that boiling hot coffee all over the lap of our second passenger. Now, what's his reaction as that boiling liquid hits his tender flesh? Does he go, man, that hurt? Yeah, he does. He feels the pain. But then does he rip the parachute from his shoulders, throw it to the floor and say, the stupid parachute? No. Why should he? He didn't put the parachute on for a better flight. He put it on to save him from the jump to come. If anything, the hot coffee incident causes him to cling tighter to the parachute and even look forward to the jump. <laughs> now, if you and I are put on the Lord Jesus Christ for the biblical motive, to flee from the wrath that's to come when tribulation strikes, when the flight gets bumpy, we won't lose our joy or peace. We won't get angry at God. Why should we? We didn't come to Christ to, for a better lifestyle, a happy lifestyle. We came to flee from the wrath that's to come. And if anything, tribulation drives the true believer closer to the Savior. And sadly, we have literally multitudes of professing Christians who lose their joy and peace when the flight gets bumpy. Why? They're the product of a man-centered gospel. They came lacking repentance without which you cannot be saved. I was in Australia some time ago. Australia is a small island off the coast of New Zealand. <laughs> and I preached sin, law, righteousness, holiness, judgment, repentance, and hell. I wasn't exactly crushed by the amount of people who wanted to give their hearts to Christ. In fact, the air went very tense. After the meeting, they said, there's a young guy down the back who wants to give his life to Jesus. I went down the back and found a teenage lad who could not pray the sinner's prayer because he was weeping so profusely. Now, for me, it was so refreshing because for many years, I suffered from the disease of evangelical frustration. I so wanted sinners to respond to the gospel, I unwittingly preached a man-centered message, the essence of which was this. You'll never find true peace without Jesus Christ. You have a God-shaped vacuum in your heart only God can fill. I'd preach Christ crucified. I'd preach repentance. A sinner would respond at the altar. I'd open an eye and say, oh, no, this guy wants to give his heart to Jesus. And there's an 80% chance he's going to backslide. And I am tired of creating backsliders. So I better make sure this guy really means it. He better be sincere. <laughs> so I'd approach the poor guy in a Gestapo spirit. I'd walk up and say, what do you want? He'd say, I'm here to become a Christian. I said, do you mean it? He'd say, yes, I do. You really mean it? He'd say, yeah, I reckon. i say, okay, I'll pray with you, but you better mean it from your heart. He'd say, all right, all right. So you bow in prayer with me, I'll lead you in prayer, and you repeat the prayer after me and mean it from your heart sincerely, and really mean it from your heart sincerely, and make sure you mean it from your heart. <laughs> oh God, I'm a sinner. And I'd watch him, and he'd say, Oh God, I'm a sinner. And I'd say, man, why isn't there a visible sign of contrition? There's no outward evidence the guy is inwardly sorry for his sins. If I could have seen his motive, I would have seen he was 100% sincere. He really did mean his decision with all his heart. He really sincerely wanted to give this Jesus thing a go to see if he'd get a buzz out of it. He tried sex, drugs, materialism, alcohol. Why don't I give this Christian a bit of go to see if it's as good as these Christians say it is? Peace, joy, love, fulfillment, lasting happiness. He wasn't fleeing from the wrath that was to come because I hadn't told him there was wrath to come. There was this glaring omission from my message. He wasn't broken in contrition and in repentance because the poor guy didn't know what sin was. Remember Paul said in Romans 7, verse 7, I had not known sin but by the law. How can a man repent if he doesn't know what sin is? Any so-called repentance would be merely what I call horizontal repentance. He's coming because he's lied to men. He's stolen from men. But when David sinned with Bathsheba and broke all ten of the Ten Commandments, when he coveted his neighbor's wife, lived a lie, committed adultery, stole his neighbor's wife, committed adultery, committed murder, dishonored his parents, and thus dishonored God, he didn't say, I've sinned against man. He said, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. 
When Joseph was tempted sexually, he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? The prodigal son said, I have sinned against heaven. Paul preached repentance towards God, and the Bible says, godly sorrow works repentance. And when a man doesn't understand that his sin is primarily vertical, that he has offended a holy God, then you not exercise biblical vertical repentance. His repentance, so-called, will be merely superficial, experimental, and horizontal. Listen to what A.B. Earl said. A.B. Earl, famous evangelist, said, I have found by long experience that the severest threatenings of the law of God have a prominent place in leading men to Christ. They must see themselves lost before they will cry for mercy. They'll not escape danger until they see it. Now, I'd like you to be very honest with me. I will not embarrass you. I give you my word. If you were thinking of something else when I shared that quote from A.B. Earl with you, I'd like you to lift your hand. But before you do, I'll be honest with you. When I was reading that quote from A.B. Earl, I wasn't listening either. I was thinking of something else. I was thinking nobody's listening to me. They're thinking of something else. <laughs> so just to illustrate a very important point, I will not embarrass you. If you were thinking of something else and you haven't got a clue what A.B. Earl said, could you lift up your hand nice and high and real quick, please? It's usually after two-thirds. Yeah, we've got, we've got at least two-thirds here today. Okay, we'll try again. This teaching is called Hell's Best Kept Secret. For years, we've tried to get it on audio tape without any problems. There's always been some sort of problems, something missing on audio tape. Just recently, I was up in Illinois, and we got it on audio tape, a whole hour, quality message. The whole tape, except for one sentence, was cut out when the tape got turned. That sentence was, Satan doesn't want you to hear this message. This teaching is called Hell's Best Kept Secret, and Satan doesn't want you to hear this message. So gird up the loins of your mind and listen to what this man, A.B. Earl, said, who was a famous evangelist of the last century, had 150,000 converts to substantiate this claim, so listen very closely. This is what he said. I have found by long experience that the severest threatenings of the law of God have a prominent place in leading men to Christ. They must see themselves lost before they will cry for mercy. They will not escape danger until they see it. You see, you try and save a man from drowning when a man doesn't believe he's drowning. Okay, you see him swimming in a lake. You say, oh, he's going over a rip. He's going to be in danger. Well, I'll just save him. You don't warn him. You don't explain things. You just dive in, grab him by the throat, pull him to the shore. He's not going to be very happy with you. Let him swallow 15 gallons of water. Let him go down 10 or 15 times. When he reaches up to be saved, when you take him by the hand, he'll know what you're trying to do for him. He'll appreciate it, and he'll cooperate with you. They must see themselves lost before they will cry for mercy. They'll not escape danger until they see it. So if you came to me and says, hey, Ray, this is a cure to Gronin's disease. I sold my house to raise the money to get this cure. I'm giving it to you as a free gift. I'd probably react by saying, it's a cure to what? Gronin's disease? You sold your house to raise the money to get this cure? Giving it to me as a free gift? <laughs> Why, thanks a lot. Bye. The guy's a nut. That's how I'd react. If you sold your house to raise the money to get a cure for a disease I've never heard of and you give it to me as a free gift, I think you're rather strange. But instead, if you said to me, Hey, Ray, you've got Gronenson's disease. I can see 10 clear symptoms on your flesh. You're going to be dead in two weeks. And then I said, oh, man, what should I do? Because I came, became convinced I had the disease. And then you said, don't worry, this is a cure to Gronenson's disease. Sold my house to raise the money to get this cure. Give it to you as a free gift. I'm not going to despise your sacrifice. I'm going to appreciate it. I'm going to appropriate it. Why? Because I've seen the disease that I might appreciate the cure. And Sally, what's happening in the United States and the Western world has followed as we have preached the cure without first convincing of the disease. And consequently, almost everybody I try and witness to in Southern California around the Bible Belt has been born again six or seven times. So you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. I did that when I was 7, 11, 17, 23, 25, 28, 32. And the guy is absolutely convinced he's saved. He's a Christian because he's born again. He's a blasphemer. He's a fornicator. There's no way you can be saved. What's happening is he's using the grace of God for an occasion of the flesh. For him, it's not a bad thing to trample the blood of Jesus Christ underfoot. Why? Because he's never seen his disease that he might appreciate the cure. You see, biblical evangelism is always, without question, law to the proud and grace to the humble. Never will you see Jesus giving the gospel, the good news, the cross, the grace of our God to a proud, arrogant, self-righteous person. Now, with the law, he breaks the hard heart. With the gospel, he heals the broken heart. Why? Because he always did those things that please the Father. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Scripture says, everyone who is proud of heart is an abomination to the Lord. 
Jesus told us whom the gospel is for. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, and the blind. Now, they are spiritual statements. The poor in spirit, the brokenhearted are the contrite ones, those who are mourning in Zion, those who know their sinners, the captives, those of whom Satan has taken captive to do his will, the blind, those of whom the God of this world has blinded, at least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine to them. Only the sick need a physician, and only those who are convinced of the disease will appreciate and appropriate the cure. So what we're going to do is look at examples of Lord of the proud and grace to the humble. Uh, Luke 10, 25. Now when I give you a biblical reference from the pulpit, I'll give it twice, because I know that men are present, and men need to be told things twice. Men need to be told things twice. This can be backed up biblically when God speaks to men in the Bible. He uses the name twice. Abraham, Abraham. Saul, Saul. Moses, Moses. Samuel, Samuel. Because men need to be told things twice. <laughs> woman, once. It's amazing. You tell a woman something, she retains it. I don't know how many times I've sat in a pew. The preacher said, Luke 10, 25. I turn to my wife and say, what do you say? She says, Luke 10, 25. Say, Thanks, love. Help mate. That's why God created women, because men cannot handle it on their own. The whole idea is men lose things, women find things. Where's the keys, love? Hanging on your nose, dear. How many times have I opened a cupboard? There's no honey here, honey. She says, here it is here, dear. Where would man be without women? Still in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Eve found the tree. Adam didn't really know what was going on. In fact, if you look at the creation of woman, to create woman, the Bible says God put man into a deep sleep, and the Scriptures doesn't say they came out of it. <laughs> so Luke 10, 25, let me paraphrase it for you. A certain lawyer stood up and he tempted Jesus and said, how can I get everlasting life? Here we have a potential convert, someone asking, how can I get everlasting life? Most of us, if someone approaches us on the street and says, excuse me, you're a Christian, how do I get everlasting life? We'll probably say, oh, quickly, say this prayer before you change your mind. But what did Jesus do with this potential convert? He gave him the law. Why? Because here was a certain lawyer. This is not an attorney. This is a professing expert in God's law. Standing up and tempting Jesus. He was proud, arrogant, and self-righteous. The spirit of his question was, and what do you think we've got to do to get everlasting life? He wasn't humble. He wasn't sincerely seeking truth. So Jesus gave him the law. He said, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? He says, I shall love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, this do, and you shall live. And then Scripture says, but he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, which neighbors? So he didn't mind Jews, but he didn't like Samaritans. So Jesus told him the story of the good Samaritan, as we call it, who wasn't good at all. And loving his neighbor as much as he loved himself, he merely obeyed the basic requirements of God's law. And the effect of the essence of the law, the spirituality of the law, of what the law demands in truth, was that man's mouth was stopped. He did not love his neighbor to that degree. He was guilty of breaking the law. The law was given to stop every mouth and leave the whole world guilty before God. Similarly, in Luke 18, verse 18, the rich young ruler came to Jesus, said, how can I get everlasting life? What did Jesus do? Give him grace? No, he gave him the law. He gave him five horizontal commandments, commandments to do with his fellow men. And he says, ah, I've kept those from my youth. And Jesus said, one thing you lack. And he used the essence of the first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me to show this man that his God was his money. And you cannot serve God and mammon. Lord of the proud. And then we see grace being given to the humble in the case of Nicodemus who was a godly Jew, who was a leader in Israel, therefore he knew the law. He was a teacher in Israel. He had a humble heart because he came to Jesus as a leader in Israel and acknowledged the deity of the Son of God. He said, we know you've come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do unless God is with him. So Jesus gave the sincere seeker of truth, who had a humble heart, who knew the law, the good news of the fine being paid for him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It was not foolishness to Nicodemus, but the power of God unto salvation. Similarly, in the case of Nathaniel, John 1, Nathaniel was an Israelite brought up under the law, indeed, not just in word, in whom there was no guile or deceit. And obviously, the law was a schoolmaster to bring this godly Jew to Christ. Same with the Jews on the day of Pentecost. 
When Peter stood up to preach on the day of Pentecost, to whom was he speaking? Oh, these were devout Jews. These were godly Jews who ate, drank, and slept God's law, who Matthew Henry, the Bible commentator, said were gathered together on the day of Pentecost to actually celebrate the giving of God's law on Mount Sinai. So when Peter stood up, he didn't preach wrath, law, judgment. They knew all that. The law works wrath. It's a teacher. They knew they were under God's anger. He just told them the good news of the fine being paid for them, and they were pricked in their heart and cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ, that they might be justified through faith in his blood. As the hymn writer says, By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 says, But we know that the law is good if anyone uses it lawfully for the purpose for which it was designed. What was God's law designed for? following verse tells us, it says, The law was not made for a righteous man, but for sinners. Even lists of sinners, homosexuals, fornicators. If you want to bring a homosexual to Christ, give him the Ten Commandments. Don't get into an argument over with him about his lifestyle. He's ready for these Bible-bashing fundamentalists. He knows those verses. Just give him the Ten Commandments. Show him that he is damned despite his lifestyle. If you want to bring a Jew to Christ, lay the weight of the law upon him. Let it prepare his heart for grace, as happened to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. You want to bring a Muslim to Christ, give him the law of Moses. Muslims accept Moses as a prophet. Well, give them Moses' law. Open up the spirituality of the law. Out of a Muslim reading a book, Hell's Best Kept Secret. And God soundly saved him purely through the reading of the book. Why? Because the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Think of the woman caught in the act of adultery. The law called for her blood. She found herself between a rock and a hard place. She had no avenue of escape. The only thing she could do was fling herself at the feet of the Son of God. And that's the function of the law. It condemns. She had no other avenue of escape. So you, you can't condemn sinners. Saints, they're already condemned. Romans 3 verse 17, He that believes not is condemned already. All the law does is show him himself in truth. It shows him his danger, that he might flee from the wrath that's to come. It's like this. Some of you ladies might identify with this. You've got a wooden table. You dust it down in the morning. It is dust-free. Then you draw back the curtains and let in the early morning sunlight. What do you see on the table? Dust. What do you see in the air? Dust. Did the light create the dust? Mm -mm. The light merely exposed the dust. And when you and I take the time to draw back the curtains of the Holy of Holies and let the light of God's law shine upon the sinner's heart, all that, he ha all that happens is he sees himself in truth. The commandment is a lamp and the law is light. That's why Paul says, by the commandment, sin became exceedingly sinful. In other words... He saw sin in its true light under the brilliance of God's holy law. And normally in the past I've gone through the Ten Commandments one by one, but I think it'd be more beneficial if I just share with you how I witness of my faith. Um, I'm a great believer in following the footsteps of Jesus when it comes to witnessing. I would never, ever go up to someone and say, Jesus loves you, mainly because it's unbiblical. You won't find any precedent in Scripture. Totally unscriptural. Neither would I say to somebody, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus Christ. See, if you're asleep and I wanted to awaken you, I wouldn't get a flashlight and flash it in your eyes. That's going to offend you. I'd use a light to know. So I believe in following the footsteps of Jesus, first the natural, then the spiritual. Why? Because the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They're foolishness to him because they're spiritually understood. So how did Jesus witness? We have an example in John chapter 4. When he met the woman at the well, he began in the natural realm, spoke to her of water, swung to the spiritual, brought conviction using the Ten Commandments, specifically the seventh of the Ten Commandments. Then he brought grace once she was convinced of the disease of sin. <clears throat> so I, when I witness, <clears throat> so I, when I witness to people, go up and just begin talking in the natural realm. I'll say, how are you doing? Nice day. You live around this area? Just get to know them a little bit. Let them feel my sanity, if I've got any. Then I might use one of our gospel tracks. I say, have you seen this? I've got a gift for you. And I say, which looks longer, pink or blue? And they say, oh, the blue. And I swap them over, and now the pink looks bigger. It's just an optical illusion. I say, isn't that neat? And they say, yeah, it's amazing. How does that work? I say, no, but they're the same size. You can have that. They say, hey, thanks a lot. I say, I've got another gift for you. And in my pocket, I always have pennies with the Ten Commandments on them. Now, it's legal to do this. We purchase these pennies from the bank, brand new, they look nice and gold and sparkly. We put an impression of the Ten Commandments on them. This is considered art, it's not defacing U.S., um, it's not, uh, not transgressing U.S. law. 
So I say, here, I've got a gift for you, and I give it to them. Now, it looks like it's gold. I mean, it looks really nice. I say, hey, thanks a lot. I say, what is it? I say, it's a penny with the Ten Commandments on it. Now, what I'm actually doing is putting out a feeler to see if this person is open to spiritual things. If he says, yeah, thanks a lot, well, he's not open, change the subject, go back to talking about the weather. But if he says, which they mostly do, hey, this is really neat, hey, thanks a lot. I say, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? And he says, oh, yeah, pretty much. Haven't killed anyone yet. <laughs> I say, oh, yeah. I say, let's go through them. Have you ever told a lie? He says, oh, yeah, one or two. I say, what does that make you? He says, a sinner. I say, no, no. More specifically, what does it make you? He says, well, man, I'm not a liar. I say, well, how many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Ten and a bell rings and a little <laughs> forehead liar? Isn't it true you tell one lie makes you a liar? He says, yeah, I guess I'm a liar. Have you ever stolen something? He says, no. Say, Come on, you've just admitted to me you're a liar. <laughs> say, have you ever stolen something even if it's small? He says, yeah. I say, what does that make you? He says, a thief. Say, so, you know, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Ever done that? He says, yeah, plenty of times. I say, well, from your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart, and you have to face God on judgment, damn. We've only looked at three of the Ten Commandments. Now, the seven were the canons pointed out. You ever use God's name in vain? He says, yeah, I've been trying to stop. It's just a habit I've got. Instead of using a four-letter filth word beginning with S, you use God's name in its place to express disgust. He's the God who gave you life. And you use his name as a curse word. That's called blasphemy. In every idle word a man speaks or give an account thereof on the day of judgment. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You're a blasphemer as well. The Bible says if you hate someone, you're a murderer. God gave you life. You're commanded to love him with heart, mind, soul, and strength. But no doubt you've made a God to suit yourself, created a God in your own image, transgressing the second of the Ten Commandments. But people say, oh, no, no, I believe God's like this. And they create a God to suit their sins. They say, well, my God would never create hell. My God's a God of love and mercy. If someone says that to you, agree with them. Say, you're right, your God would never create hell because he couldn't. He doesn't exist. He's a figment of your imagination. <laughs> the place of imagery. You've shaped a God to suit yourself and you've snuggled up your cuddly God, the non-existent God. There is one God, he says, I'm the Lord, I change not. And I'll by no means clear the guilty. Now the wonderful thing about God's law is that God has taken the time to write it on our hearts. Romans 2 verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, the conscience bearing witness. Conscience means with knowledge. Con is with, science is knowledge. So every time he lies or steals or lusts or blasphemes, he knows in his heart that he's done wrong. God has given light to every man. So I say, so if God judges you by the standard of this law, are you going to be innocent or guilty on the day of judgment? He says, oh, guilty. I say, well, do you think you'll go to heaven or hell? And the usual answer is, heaven. I say, why is that? You think God's good and he'll overlook your sins? Yeah, that's it. I say, well, try that in a court of law. You're standing before the judge and you're guilty of rape, murder, and drug pushing. Very serious crimes. The judge says, you're guilty. Anything to say before I pass sentence? And you say, yes, judge. <clears throat> I like to say, I believe you're a good man and therefore you'll overlook my crimes. The judge would probably say, you're right about one thing. I am a good man. And because of my goodness, I'm going to see that justice is done. Because of my goodness, I'm going to see that you're thrown into prison. And the thing that sinners are hoping will save them on the day of judgment, the goodness of God, will be the very thing that will condemn them. Because if God is good, he must, by nature, punish liars, murderers, rapists, thieves. And he's going to punish sin wherever it's found. So what happens is the conscience condemns. The law condemns. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. He's now able to understand that he has offended God. He has angered God. The wrath of God abides upon him that he has sinned against heaven. Therefore, he can now exercise repentance towards God. He can see that he's weighed in the balance of eternal justice and found wanting. And now he can understand that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's as simple as this. We broke the law, he paid the fine. He stepped in and paid the fine for us when we were guilty. God commanded his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we can now exercise repentance towards God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have time to share these quotes with you, but they're from men whose names I'm sure you'll recognize, men who advocated the use of the law in evangelism. And when you read the quotes, they're in our literature, you can see that 
their conviction is so strong, they say things like, if you don't use the law in evangelism, you're going to fill the church with false converts, which our churches are filled. John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, Matthew Henry, John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, John Bunyan, John Newton, Charles Finney. See, John Wesley said, preach 90% law and 10% grace. 90% law, you say, that's heavy. Can't we make it 50-50? Think of it like this. <clears throat> I'm a doctor. You're a patient. You have a terminal disease. I have the cure. But it's essential you take this whole cure that you're not half-hearted. You must take the whole prescription right to the end or it will not be beneficial to you. So how am I going to handle it? Probably like this. Come in. Sit down. I've got some very serious news for you. You have a terminal disease. I see you begin to shake. I say to myself, good. He's beginning to see the seriousness of the situation. For 10 whole minutes, I talk about the disease. I mean, I bring out charts. I bring out x-rays. I bring out books. I show you x-rays of this poison seeping through your system. For 10 whole minutes, I talk about this terrible disease and its horrific consequences. How long, therefore, do you think I'm then going to have to talk about the cure? Not long at all. I say, oh, oh, by the way, here's the cure. You'll go, <laughs> what's happened? Your knowledge of the disease and its horrific consequence has made you desire the cure. And that's the function of God's law. You see, Jesus said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. How many non-Christians do you know that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Probably none. They love the darkness. They hate the light. Neither will they come to the light, lest their deeds be exposed. They drink iniquity like water. I had as much desire for righteousness before I was a Christian as a four-year-old boy has for the word bath. What's the point? Bath. What's the point? Righteousness. I was enjoying the pleasures of sin. But when I was confronted with God's law, the night of my conversion, I began to understand that God required truth in the inward parts, that He sees the thought life, He sees the darkness as pure light. He sees it from a standard of holiness, manifest in His law. He considers lust to be adultery, hatred to be, to be murder. I began to say, wow, what should I do to be made right? I began to thirst for righteousness. Why? Because the law put salt on my tongue. Charles Spurgeon said they'll never accept grace until they tremble before a just and holy law. Martin Luther said, <clears throat> Satan, the god of all dissension, stirs up daily new sects. Last of all, which of all other I should never have foreseen or once suspected, he has raised up a sect such as teach that men should not be terrified by the law, but gently exhorted by the preaching of the grace of Christ. So what's Luther saying? He's saying, listen, guys, there's a new sect. It's satanic. It's demonic. It's just been started up. And, and they're saying something I never would have believed that they would say. They're saying men shouldn't be terrified by the law, but gently exhorted by the preaching of the grace of Christ, which adequately sums up most of modern evangelism, sadly. When David Wilkerson called me, the first thing he said to me on the phone was, I thought I was the only one who didn't believe in follow-up. Now, I believe in feeding a new convert. I believe in nurturing him. I believe in discipling him, but I do not believe in following him. Now, what do I mean by follow-up? I mean when there's a crusade or a series of meetings and ones make decisions for Jesus, laborers are taken from the harvest fields and given the thankless, very discouraging task of following these people up to make sure they go in their faith. What follow-up is, sadly, is an admission to the amount of confidence modern evangelism has both in the power of its message and in the keeping power of God. If God has saved them, God will keep them. If he's the author of their faith, he'll be the finisher of their faith. If he's begun a good work them, he'll complete it that day. He's able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. He's able to keep them from falling before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Jesus said, no one will pluck you from my father's hand. See, what the problem is, is that Lazarus is four days dead. We've forgotten that. We can run in the tomb. We can pull him out. We can prop him up, open his eyes, but he stinketh. He must hear the voice of the Son of God. And the sinner is four days dead in his sins. We can't do anything to make him alive. We can bring him out. We can prop him up. We can say, hey, say this prayer. But he needs to hear the voice of the Son of God. And the thing that opens or primes a sinner's ear to hear the voice of the Son of God is the law. It's a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. They might be justified through faith in his blood. The law works. It converts the soul. So I leave the ball in your court. Find yourself a sinner and experiment on him. But as you do, remember this one anecdote. You're sitting in a plane, you're supping your coffee, you're biting your cookie, you're watching a movie, it's a pleasurable flight. When suddenly you hear, 
This is your captain speaking. I have an announcement to make. As the tail section's just fallen off this plane, we're about to crash. Uh, we're 25,000 feet in the air. There's a parachute on your seat. Appreciate you to put it on. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for flying with this airline. I said, what? Whoa, 25,000 feet. Man, am I glad to be wearing this parachute. You look next to the guy next to us, biting his cookies, supping his coffee, watching a movie. You say, excuse me, did you hear the captain? Put the parachute on. He turns to you and says, oh, I really don't think the captain means it. Besides, I'm quite happy as I am, thanks. Don't turn to him in sincere zeal and say, oh, please, please, put the parachute on. It'll be better than the movie. That doesn't make sense. If you tell him somehow that parachute is going to improve his flight, he's going to put it on for a wrong motive. If you wanted to put it on and keep it on, tell him about the jump. You say, excuse me, uh, ignore the captain if you want. Jump without a parachute, splat. He says, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. I said, jump without a parachute, law of gravity, <laughs> on the ground. He says, goodness me, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, thank you very much. And as long as that man knows, as long as he has knowledge, that he has to pass through the door and face the consequences of breaking the law of gravity, there's no way you're going to get that parachute off him. Why? Because his very life depends on it. Now, if you look around, you find there are multitudes of passengers enjoying the flight. They're enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. You say, excuse me, and you hear the command from the captain of salvation, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He turns to you and says, oh, I really don't think God means it. God is love. Besides, I'm quite happy as I am, thanks. Don't turn to him in sincere zeal without knowledge and say, please, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, lasting happiness, help your drug problem, help your marriage problem. Just give your heart to Jesus. No, you'll give him a wrong motive for his commitment. Instead, say, oh, God, give me courage and tell him about the jump. Just say, it's appointed a man wants to die. If you die in your sins, God will be forced to give you justice. And God's justice will be very thorough on the day of judgment. If you've lusted, you've committed adultery. If you've hated, you've committed murder. And Jesus warned the fist of eternal wrath will come upon you and grind you to powder. God bless. <laughs> Saints, I'm not talking about hellfire preaching. Hellfire preaching will produce fear-filled converts. Using God's law will produce tear-filled converts. You see, this one comes because he wants to escape the fires of hell. And in his heart, he thinks God is harsh and unjust. Because the law hasn't been used to bring the knowledge of sin and show sin is exceedingly sinful, he doesn't understand he deserves hell. Therefore, he doesn't understand mercy. Because he doesn't understand mercy, he has no gratitude to God for his mercy. And gratitude is the prime most motivation for evangelism. There's no zeal in the heart of a false convert to evangelize. But this one comes knowing he has sinned against heaven. And if God in his holiness would manifest all the secret sins of his heart, all the unclean thoughts, all the deeds done in darkness, and lay them out as evidence of his guilt. God could pick him up as an unclean thing, and cast him into hell and do that which is just. But instead of giving him justice, God has given him mercy. Instead of giving him wrath, God has commanded his love toward him, and that what is yet a sinner Christ died from. He falls on his knees in the blood-sodden soil of Calvary's cross. He says, oh God, if you do that for me, I'll do anything for you. I delight to do your will, oh my God. Your law is written on my heart. And like the man... He knew he had to pass through the door and face the consequences of breaking the law of gravity. He would never take his parachute off because his very life depended on it. So he who comes to the Savior, would knowing he has to face a holy God on a day of wrath, would never forsake the righteousness of God in Christ because his very life depends on it. Let me see if we can coagulate this teaching as I begin to draw to a close. I was in a uh, store recently, and a man was serving another man, and he's using God's name in blasphemy. Now, if someone was using my wife's name as a substitute for a curse word, that would offend me greatly. But this guy was using the name of the God who gave him life, who gave him eyesight and the ability to think and children, every pleasure he's ever had. He's using God's name as a curse word again and again while he was serving his customer. So I leaned between him and his customer and said, excuse me, is this a religious meeting? He said, what? H-E-L-L? -L? No. I said, yes, it is, because now you're talking about hell. Let me get you one of my books. So I went out to my car. I went out to my car, and I got a book that I've written called God Doesn't Believe in Atheists, Proof the Atheist Doesn't Exist. And it's a book which uses logic, rationalism, and humor to prove the existence of God and prove the atheist doesn't exist. Two, weeks later, I went, no, two months later, I went in and gave him another book I've written called My Friends Are Dying, a true and gripping story of the ministry of the gospel in the most murderous portion of Los Angeles, a book which also uses humor. Um, the guy called me and told me that his wife kept giving him filthy looks. Because there he was reading a book called My Friends Are Dying and laughing every few minutes. 
He told me what, was hap what, he happened. what happened. He was cleaning out his room, picked up God doesn't believe in atheists. He said, oh, rubbish. I opened it up, began reading it, read the first page. And he said, I read the whole 260 pages. He said, it was weird because I hate reading. Then he read, my friends are dying, gave his life to Christ, bought himself a Bible, found out where I live, come around to say hi, and told me after two days of being a Christian in his Bible, he is already up to what he called the book of Levititus. <laughs> then I guess he's going to read Job and then Palms. <laughs> but up until his commitment, the man was a practicing witch. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Such converts become, you know, it's, it's as though God looked down upon me as I was street preaching for many years and saw me fighting off the uh, enemy with a feather duster of modern evangelism. It's as though God said, what are you doing? The weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God are the pulling down of strongholds. Here are ten great cannons. And as I lined up the ten cannons of God's law, no longer did sinners scoff and mock. No, their faces went pale. They lifted their hands and said, I surrender all, all to Jesus I freely give, came across to the winning side, never to become deserters. Such converts become soul winners, not pew warmers, laborers, not layabouts, assets, not liabilities for the local church. Let's bow in prayer as we close. Now, let's not bow in prayer. With every eye open and head raised, let me just speak to you for a moment about your eternal salvation. Almost every time I've shared this teaching, ones have suddenly seen that they are not eternally secure. They didn't come before a holy God and tremble before his throne and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Their conversion was merely experimental. You'll never find what you're looking for until you come to Jesus. And you know something is radically wrong with your Christian walk. There's no burning zeal to evangelize. That's the purpose of the church, to seek and save that which is lost, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And you know something is radically wrong. There's not this burning gratitude in your heart. You lose your peace and joy when the flight gets bumpy. You know something's radically wrong. You need to readjust your motive for your commitment. See, modern evangelism says never question your salvation. The Bible says the exact opposite. It says examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. And the many who are not, I think they are. And on the day of judgment, they're going to cry out to Jesus, Lord, Lord. I mean, they've, called, they've acknowledged the Lordship of Christ. But what are they? Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's lawlessness. There's no regard to the divine law. Conversion is, let everyone that, everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, lawlessness. And there are multitudes who say, I'm a Christian, but they tell white lies. I'm a Christian, but they just take little things and don't return them. I'm a Christian, they have wandering eyes. They're lying, thieving, adulterers at heart. And on the day of judgment, you'll see God considers sin to be exceedingly sinful. So today, you need to readjust the motive for your commitment. Call it what you will, a committal, a recommittal, but whatever you do, Make your calling and election sure. So, not hindered by the fear of man or your pride, if you'd like to be included in the short prayer, I'm going to pray from the pulpit. You remain in your seat. If you'd like to be included in this prayer, slip up your hand nice and quick if you would. Father, we pray for these dear ones that have humbled themselves today and, and said, God, please do a work in my heart. We pray that there'll be a fresh understanding of the thunderings and lightnings of Mount Sinai. That... You'll take us back and we'll see Moses, your friend, exceedingly fearful and trembling. We'll hear Israel say, don't let him speak, lest we die. And then take us forward to the cross of Calvary where Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law and such was the horrific nature of his death and his suffering that it's as though you enshrouded the cross in blackness that creation may not gaze upon the face of the Son of God. Father, break our hearts. Let us understand such incredible justice, such incredible righteousness and such wondrous love. And let there be a fire of gratitude in our hearts that will motivate us to live to your will and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.